Good morning. Good morning. You'll notice that we are, as I say, sans Pursley today. Tony and Ruth Ann had a blowout on a tire, I think north of Des Moines. So they spent the night in Des Moines. I just got a text from Tony that Firestone has the tire and they are there waiting to get it, or he's there at least waiting to get it installed and he hoped to be back for this evening. So we do have a business meeting this evening. If Tony doesn't make it back, either Don or I will lead that business meeting and so, because we got the budget that we need to do so that you can see it for the first time. So pray for Tony and Ruth Ann, five kids in a hotel room. <laughs> You know, uh, but praise the Lord that because he when I talked to him on the phone last night, he said that he was passing a guy on the left and he said all of a sudden he felt that car wiggle, you know, like a big gust of wind had hit him. Well, that tire blew out and he got the car off on the side of the road and then was able to change the tire to put the donut on. But so the Lord protected him because that's a that could be a disaster right there. So. Uh, he said Madge, Madge had, because that's what he calls his old van, right? Madge had one more, one more thing in her. <laughs> so anyway, pray for them. It's good to see you here this morning, though, and I appreciate Bill filling in and uh, Pat's filling in. You know, it's just like in the sports game when one of the players goes down, they always say next, next man up, next player up. Well, this is next servant up, and so I appreciate them and their... Uh, graciousness to fill in on a Saturday night. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're, we appreciate them so much. So let's pray and, and we'll, we'll enter into worship. Father, we thank you for the blessings of life. We do thank you that you gave Tony and Ruth Ann safety last night and a roof over their head and a warm, warm room to sleep in. Uh, Father, we pray for them as they get a tire and they come back home this afternoon. We pray for their continued safety. We thank you for the safety that you gave all of us this weekend as we uh, traveled back and forth over holiday week. Lord, we love you. We look forward now to Christmas coming and singing about your first advent as we wait on your second advent. Lord, we love you. We want to worship you in spirit and truth. Enable us this morning, uh, tune our hearts directly to you uh, that we won't miss a moment of your grace. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, I'm just as surprised to be here as you are to see me. But God is good. He gave them safety. Talking about substituting uh, it's like substituting Tyreek Hill for Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so your program will not work for you. We were, will be singing out of the hymn book this morning. And the first song that we've got, For the Fruit of All Creation, 643, You Can Remain Seated. I told you this would be different. <laughs> 643. Sparing in the 
that love has found us. Thanks be to God. If you'll turn over to number 19. We praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator, and we will stand for this one. Number 19. here to remain standing. I was going to read the text for this morning, but it's the 27th, and Psalm 27 is the psalm of the day. That's my favorite psalm, so let's read a few verses from Psalm 27 and pray. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries, my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war arise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. You, you can be seated. Let's pray. Father, we, we read this text this morning. And we think of, I think of the sermon to come, oh, but if Ahaz would have just listened to his forefather David in Psalm 27, life would have been different for him. Father, there is nothing for us to fear. You have defended our lives. There is nothing to dread. There is no person who can come against us, even those who would uh, desire to devour our flesh. Father, we fear not those who can kill the body, but we fear you who could cast our soul into hell. But for your great love in sending your son Jesus to die in our place that we might have everlasting life. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Right after Thanksgiving, but before Christmas, it's a kind of, for music people anyway, it's a rather um, awkward time. You're not quite sure if you should be singing Thanksgiving songs or Christmas songs. So I decided on neither. We'll simply praise the Lord. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Number 12 in your hymn books. Great is the Lord. Are you, Lord? 
Father, we thank you for this time. We come and worship you and, and be with the, our good Christian brothers and sisters. And when we leave here, we fill with the joy that has been put in our hearts. Lord, we ask you to continue to guide and watch over us as we go about our daily lives. Be with, be with those that are still traveling. We, we thank you for Tony's safety and his family and the when they return. Father, we ask you to bless this offering and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Aren't we blessed? We've got three great piano players here. I know there are some churches that don't have any. <laughs> I've been there. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Isn't it ironic 
that for hundreds and hundreds of years, they were looking for the Messiah. And when he came, they didn't recognize him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Ha <laughs> ha, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Amen. Come thou long expected Jesus. It is the beginning of Advent, and I will put an Advent song in there. Number 77 in your hymn books. Come thou long expected Jesus. Let's stand as we sing. Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 7. I thought we would take a little break in the Advent season here, Christmas season, to step out of Acts for a little bit and we'll see how the new year, what the new year brings and how we'll get back into that maybe to finish that. But we'll do some Christmas stuff, Christmas texts leading up to our Big Christmas Eve service, and then Christmas is actually on Sunday, so it always used to drive me crazy when I would see churches that would close on Sunday morning when it was Christmas Day, and it was like, it just seems wrong, doesn't it? So we'll be here uh, when we get to that point. Are you directionally challenged? I am. Now, independence seems to be laid out a little bit more square. So it's a little bit easier for me to find my way north and south. Over at Norfleet, if you go down Blue Ridge, you know, there's a time when Blue Ridge actually turns west. And it crosses Sterling. And I would get completely turned around when I was trying to go visit somebody from Norfleet over in that part of town because... I would have sworn on a stack of Bibles that Sterling was headed east and west at that point. And I, because you're headed south on Blue Ridge and then pretty soon you turn and you come to Sterling and it's going north and south, but it looks east and west. I'm directionally challenged. I, don't, I mean, I'm glad I have that little compass <laughs> down in the corner of my uh, gauges and stuff on the car, the display on the car, so I can always tell, boy, it doesn't feel like I'm headed west, but I guess I am. We need, we all need some direction, especially when we're directionally challenged. We need to see the signs. We need to heed the signs. You need to see what direction you're going. You need to heed the signs. Unlike many of our fellow Americans, when the 
highway sign says left lane closed. Now, I get the whole zipper thing, okay? I get that now. But we didn't used to do that, right? And all those people would drive down that left lane, left lane closed, as if that sign didn't mean anything. And it means stuff. If, if it said the bridge is out, I'm sure some of our fellow Americans would have driven over the bridge into the creek because they just don't see the signs. They don't pay attention. There is, in Isaiah's time, I just read through it again this morning, sitting back there in the office, those first couple of chapters as you read through the opening pages of the book of Isaiah. It's just brutal. There's rebellion in the land. The people have broken hearts, and they have broken wanters. They want what they want when they want it, and it doesn't have anything to do with what the Lord God wants. They simply choose to do what is right in their own eyes. Twice that is mentioned in the book of Judges. I believe it's the last verse of the book of Judges. People do what's right in their own eyes. They've set themselves up as a little g God, and they worship their world and themselves and the creation, and they disrespect the Creator in the rebellion against Him. We look at our own world. We no longer worship the God, the world doesn't, worship the God who made us male and female, created in His image. We no longer worship the equality, uh, the God who created equality in marriage and also created order and submission in families and even the order in how the church functions. The people were, at times, in Isaiah's day, they were very religious. They brought and they touted their sacrifices. Read those first two chapters of the book of Isaiah. God was worn out with their sacrifices. He was worn out with they, them thinking that they were earning his favor by doing half-rate, second-rate, leftover-type sacrifices. That's first chapter of the book of Malachi ought to slay you every time you read it. When God says, I wish someone would just close the doors to the altar because they are kindling those useless sacrifices. It's not buying them any grace as they attempted to buy grace. He gives it free. You can't buy it. They're very religious. And that's what Isaiah is dealing with. Isaiah, though, as we lead up to this great prophecy in Isaiah 7, you can't dismiss Isaiah 6 because Isaiah is about the business that God has called him to do. Why? Because he has seen the glory of the Lord. And when you and I get a glimpse of the glory of the Lord, there isn't anything that anybody can put in our way that can hinder us from doing the ministry short of God challenging us to get through some issues, which he does from time to time. He lets things happen so that we really know what it's like to depend upon him. So this morning as we read this text and we see Isaiah's commission and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and he is a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips because we like to honor the Lord with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. Um, he gets a brutal commissioning. I mean, I don't know, you know, if, if they gave this commissioning to all of us seminary guys when we rolled up at seminary, I'm not sure all of us would have stayed. See what he says there in chapter 6. Um, he says, then I heard the voice of the Lord, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Now that's true blue Christianity. That's what true blue Christianity looks like. You and I should have experience, if we have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have seen His glory in some measure. And that glory drives our passions for the ministry and for people and for uh, the advancement of the kingdom of God. And it drives us nuts when the world goes the opposite direction. Look what he says. Keep, and he said, he, God said, go and tell the, this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. 
Render the hearts of the people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? <laughs> he just got a difficult commissioning. Lord, how long is this going to go on? Until the cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. I promise you, if they'd have told me that at seminary, I'd have found something else to do. Probably. Probably not. I've always believed, you know, my ministry was the Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel ministry. I never expected, you know, it to be smooth sailing <laughs> uh, at any point in time. So now we get to Isaiah chapter 7, where we're going to get, uh, we're going to learn some things about Ahaz here, and that's really the focus. The focus is actually not specifically so much on the prophecy of the virgin birth, we'll, and we're going to talk about it, but the, the sermon this morning is about Ahaz and not being him. We don't want to be him. Don't be that guy, as they like to say. I would invite you to stand. It's, we'll, we'll read these first 16 verses, if you're able. If you're not, that's fine. Isaiah 7, Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have encamped in Ephraim. His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees in the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Sheer Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin, and Aram, and the son of Remaliah. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have planned evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrorize it, and make for ourselves a breach in its walls, and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand. Nor shall it come to pass, for the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he, Isaiah said, listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Lord, we ask the blessing, your blessing on the reading of your word. Help us to apply it to our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So here we have Isaiah. He's been commissioned. It's a tough commissioning, but... Because of the glory of the Lord, when you have seen the glory of the Lord, the tough commissioning doesn't really hinder you much. You're going to go do what you've been called to do. And so <clears throat> it comes about now you have Ahaz, and he is set up as king. And these two other kingdoms, one Israel, the northern kingdom, and then the Sumerians, Samaritans in that area of southern Syria, now they are coming against they have seen the Assyrians, different from the Syrians. The Assyrians are farther north. And these other two northern areas have seen what Assyria looks like they're about to do. So they have showed up down at Jerusalem to try to get good old Ahaz in their group. They're trying to form a coalition against Assyria. Ahaz doesn't want to do that. And what Ahaz eventually winds up and does 
was he makes a deal with the Assyrians. He doesn't trust the Lord. He doesn't do what the Lord has called him to do. So that's the situation. He looks out there and these armies have camped against him. And it looks like they're going to try to overthrow him. And they actually try to overthrow him and they can't get it done. And then the Lord says, well, they're not going to get it done. It's not going to stand. They're smoldering firebrands. So I've got three questions to ask this morning as you check which direction you're headed. Are you headed in the direction of active, vibrant, dynamic, crazy, out of this world ministry? (laughs) Or are we just trying to play it safe? We try to look for the worldly solutions. So the first question that I would ask this morning is, will you live in the real world with practical ideas and solutions? Or will you live in the kingdom of God as a child of God, begging, pleading, and knowing that God will answer, and that His answer will be good according to His own will? Whatever God does is good. He doesn't do it because it was good. It's good because He does it. All the good is wrapped up in God. He's going to do good. Everybody is going to come to a crisis of faith in your life. That's the Henry Blackaby. Uh, now I lost it. What was... No, uh, experiencing God. Did you, anybody do experiencing God in here? Remember that? That one section in there where everyone comes to a crisis of faith. Where you're going to have to decide, am I going to follow the Lord... Or am I going to do it my own way or am I going to do it the world's way? You know, I've seen churches before who will attempt on a rare occasion, they get a little bit misguided in their direction and they think that we might be able to use some ungodly methods to gain godly ground. And that will never work. (laughs) You will never use ungodly methods in order to gain heavenly ground or godly ground, it won't work. But everybody's going to come to a crisis of faith. And good old Ahaz has come to a crisis of faith. He's in a tough spot. He's not sure what to do. He's out when these guys are, when Isaiah's looking for him, where is he at? Well, he's out trying to make sure the water supply into Jerusalem is safe. He's got to make sure that the water supply hasn't been cut off by these guys. Uh, and so he's, he's got a crisis of faith. You and I will either trust the Lord or you will trust the politicians, the attorneys, the surgeons, the church revitalization guys, the IMB, NAM, or even pagan organizations for your sufficiency in the world. What Ahaz is faced with is life and death. Doesn't look like life and death. But it's life and death. Ahaz is going to end this piece of the throne of David. He's going to end it. And the prophecy is, Isaiah is going to say, the next successor to the throne of David is going to be Emmanuel. And we see that as Assyria comes in and then Babylon comes in later, they all set up their little puppet kings and they all, and those guys... They were not part of the plan. Uh, And so here he is. He's got got problems on all fronts. Who's he going to trust? Well, he's trying to cut a political deal. (laughs) You know when the politicians are lying, right? Because their lips are moving. And so you... Now, not all. I get that. There are some really fine Christian folks who have surrendered into public ministry in that realm, and God bless them. We need those people out there. Um, But you and I are not going to trust. I mean, we can't. If our ultimate trust is in Washington, D.C. or Jefferson City, oh, we are to be the most pitied people around. If our hope is in the next health care plan or what they're going to do with Social Security in the next round, We are to be pitied. Our hope is in God. We have to trust God. When I was at Northfleet, uh, my administrative assistant had been there for 15 years. Uh, She's now home with the Lord. She battled breast cancer the whole time I was there. And uh, toward the end of her ability to work, she was talking about getting on uh, disability. She was going to go to Social Security and get on disability. 
And the dear sweet folks around the church from time to time when they would visit, and she was real close to a lot of those people. She'd been there 15 years. And they would tell her, well, you're not going to get your Social Security, that disability on the first time. And I bet there's a bunch of y'all in this room that would say the same thing. Well, I went to get my disability, and they turned me down, and I had to go back, and I had to go back, and I had to get a lawyer. And that happens. Maybe that happened to you. I'm sorry if that happened to you. But I got so frustrated with our folks because she needed that disability. She wasn't going to be able to work. And so I decided, I'm going to storm the heavens every day. And a bunch of other folks that were in the same mindset, we stormed the heavens every day, begging the Lord to give her her disability in the first meeting and just blow everybody's mind. Just blow their minds. Just. And I saw there were times when she would be very discouraged because... People mean well, they meant well, they were trying not to have her get her hopes up that she was going to get disability soon and she wasn't going to be able to work much longer and it was just bad. Man, can we just be encouraging to people sometimes? Can we just tell people, if you think that God's not going to do that, would you just keep your mouth shut and just tell the person that, We'll just pray for you that that'll work out in God's timing and God's will exactly the way God wants it to. If you just say that, you're not Job's buddies, okay? So she goes to the first meeting. Man, and we stormed the heavens. We stormed the heavens. We stormed the heavens. We took heaven by force with those prayers. First meeting, she gets her disability approved. First meeting. First meeting. And then everybody, and Mike said this on a Wednesday night, well, golly, we were just praying about that. <laughs> like we were surprised that God actually did that. Well, see, Ahaz isn't in that mindset. Storm the heavens, Ahaz. Get your boys to storm the heavens. Get your WMU to storm the heavens. Get the deacons to storm the heavens. Storm the heavens and ask God to move heaven and hell out of the way so that people can have life. But what does he do? He won't do it. He's, he's too busy cutting a political deal out there. Why does God do... Why has he got Ahaz in this place? Why does he hem you in sometimes in a place? So that you will know that as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? My God is in the heavens, and he does as he pleases. Don't think that God is not active in our world to make things happen. Now, it can be miraculous, and he does miracles, and some of us have experienced the miracle of healing, and that is grand, some of us have not. But God is in the business of answering those prayers and He will move people's hearts to do what He wants them to do. Just like the Social Security Administration. Man, I'm storming the heavens thinking, man, Lord, Social Security Administration. And then it kind of dawns on me. It's like, you know what? The Lord is not concerned about the SSA. <laughs> he doesn't care. He's bigger than they are. He will make them do what he wants them to do exactly when he wants them to do it. And you can say, well, what about my free will? Thank God that your free will doesn't trump God's will. Because <laughs> if your free will trumped God's will, you'd all, we'd all be going to hell in a handbasket, okay? That's just the way it works. Will you live in the world of practical ideas and solutions? Or will you live... In the kingdom of God as a child of God, begging and pleading and knowing that God will answer and that His answer will be good because He is good. You can trust Him with everything. You can trust the Lord God with your life. 
Ahaz is going to play the pious card. I've seen guys play the pious card before. I might have even played it myself a time or two. What happens then? Well, the Lord... Did you notice there in verse 10? So he's got this mess out there. And then verse 10, Isaiah records, Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz. This direct communication from God to Ahaz? Well, I'm not sure. It says he spoke again to Ahaz, so it very well may be that it is Isaiah speaking, but Isaiah wants you and I to know this is God's word. This is what God has said. And if God opened the heavens and spoke audibly to Ahaz at that time, I'm good with that. Personally, I think it comes through Isaiah. But this is God's prophecy that he is giving. And what does he say? Ask a sign for yourself. You want to know how to go? You want to know, want to know what direction to go in? Ahaz, well, you're going to have to get a sign to point you in the right direction. Ask for a sign. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. That's a pretty, that's a pretty broad swath. As deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. That basically says there's not one thing that you could ask of the Lord for Him to demonstrate to you that He will not do in this moment. Not one thing. High as heaven, deep as Sheol, ask whatever you want. Anything, anything, you can ask it. And what does he do? I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. You know, in the realm of the kingdom of God, our unbelief is without excuse. Faith replaces all those other options of the government and the doctors and the attorneys. Faith replaces all those options. Because we use those people. Well, sure we can use those people. Sure we use the attorneys and the doctors. But our trust is not so much in them as it is in God who directs them. You know, I don't know how good, and we may have some medical, we've got medical folks I'm sure in here. I don't care how good you are. <laughs> I don't care how great my doctors have been who gave me back my health. They got no cure for death. They have no cure for death. There's only one person got the cure for death. It's Emmanuel, God with us. He's going to be, he's promised to come. And he came and he did what he was supposed to do. He ascended to heaven. He's coming back one day to receive his own unto himself. In the realm of the kingdom of God, unbelief is without excuse. Faith replaces all other options as a practical reality of the times. Now when you do that, people are going to think you are nuts. I don't think I, of the half of the churches that I have pastored, this is the fifth one, sixth one, half of them, I took significant pay cuts to become the pastor. I mean, huge pay cuts. Why? Because that's God's calling me to that. As I've shared at other times, when Becky and I got ready to move to Kansas City in 1996, I calculated that in July of 1996, we would be bankrupt and we would file for bankruptcy and we wouldn't have anything, any more money. And a friend of mine at Warren Petroleum, Chevron, where I was working, said, well, how are you going to survive? What are you going to do? I said, I don't know. It's all up to God. I'd rather be in the center of God's will and not have two nickels to rub together than to be outside of God's will and have all my stuff. Now, thanks be to him, he didn't make me rub those two nickels together. He had a job at the seminary that made up all the difference in our income that we needed to survive. Had no idea. Becky used to tell me, you, you should go look in the IT department. I bet they can use your skill in the IT department at Midwestern Seminary. And I would do this. Back off, woman. I have been called of God to preach the word. Three months later, I was employed in the IT department at Midwestern Seminary <laughs> and was the IT director at Midwestern Seminary on two different occasions because I actually left to pastor a church and came back and they hired me back. So, hey, you know, you must have done something right. But you can't live in the world of practical ideas. My dad thought I was, we were going to the poorhouse. He wasn't a Christian at the time. He thought, that's the dumbest thing I ever, I'm just going to trust the Lord. I'm just going to trust the Lord. 
And it's not some Pollyanna trust that we have. Because you got real hurts and real issues and real health problems and all of that stuff. And none of us are walking off planet Earth anyway. We're all going in a casket. Unless he comes back this afternoon. Will you live in the world of practical ideas? Or will you live as a child of God begging and pleading? Second question. Will you be obedient? Now here's how you know. Here's how you know if you're going to do the first thing. Will you be obedient to the clear commands of the Lord? Ask for yourself. The Lord spoke and said, Ask for yourself a sign from the Lord your God. As big a sign as you want. What bigger sign could reach the depths of Sheol or the heights of heaven but for a young girl who is of marrying age but is unmarried to have to come up pregnant? without any interaction with a male. No relations. What bigger sign could you get? Well, the only sign I could come up bigger than that is if a dead guy comes up out of the grave. It's the only sign I could get that was bigger than a woman without any relations with any man to be pregnant. Only time in the history of the universe that that has happened. And it would be the only time until the universe ends that it will happen. Jesus is the unique, only begotten Son of God. Maybe a dead man coming back to life on the third day, having been crucified on a cross, would be as big a sign. Maybe that would be a bigger sign than a young girl. And there's all kinds of debates about the words that Isaiah used. My advice to you is go read Alec Motyers, M-O-T-Y-E-R, Alec, A-E-L-E-C, I think. Read his commentary. Uh, and that's the commentary I used for this sermon. He does a great word study on those words about virgin and young maiden and all of that stuff. And he pretty much shows that Isaiah is talking about exactly what Matthew picks up when Jesus is born. Isaiah is not playing games here. He's, he, he actually says exactly, a virgin will be with child. That young girl is old enough to be married, but is not married and has now had a child, and that shouldn't be. And that's exactly how Jesus comes into our existence. Will you be obedient to the clear commands? Ahaz was not going to stress out the Lord by asking for too big a sign. I, I can remember when I was praying for Rhonda, my administrative assistant at Norfleet. I never once did that, Lord, if it be your will. I just chattered away <laughs> at God. I just banged on that door like the poor little widow woman before the unrighteous judge. And I just believe that if we know how to give good gifts to our children, that our Heavenly Father would give a good gift to us and to her at that time. And that's exactly what he did. Are you and I going to play games with the text? Are we going to try to get God off the hook? See, I don't hardly ever pray trying to get God off the hook. I don't always even pray if it be your will. Now, that's always in, the, in play, right? It's always if God's will. Because there are things about the universe and about life and about your own life and about yourself that you and I don't know what God is doing. And we may not know and probably won't know until we actually meet Jesus face to face. But we trust Him that what He does is good and that He will not leave us out in the cold. So we've got to be obedient to what He's called us to do. You are my friends, Jesus says in John 14 and 16. You are my friend, or 15. You are my friends if you do what I, what I command. Now, we can have all of the discussion about looking for a sign. Here's my take on asking for a sign. It's not a big deal to ask for a sign if you're willing to obey the answer to the sign. <laughs> but there's a lot of folks that want a sign that they don't actually want to do it. They don't want to follow through with it. They're not going to obey it. When we... I've shared before was we were headed to Kenya. We didn't know how to get there. We didn't know what to do. And we prayed, Lord, we're not going to make another movement until you open the door. 
And the next week, there's emails about a missionary from Kenya that was now on staff at Midwestern, Ted Davis. He was there at Midwestern for 18 months. That allowed me to interact with him enough to get the team off and going, and now we've had five trips to Kenya. Will you be obedient to what he has called us to do? Just ask. One of the, you know, what does Jesus say? You have not because you ask not. Let's ask. And yes, ask according to God's will. It's not to line our own pockets or to advance our own ministry or to put another feather in our cap for what we have done. He's going up against these guys. Did you notice how negative, as we read that first part, how negative Isaiah is? He won't even call, he only calls, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, Pika or Paka. He only, he only uses his name once. The other time he just calls him the son of Ramaliah. He won't even give him his name. He's just the son of Ramaliah. I mean, he's dissing him big time right there. And he gives Isaiah... Direct, ask a sign, ask a sign, and he won't do it. It is not a request for a sign that we are doubting the Lord. If you need to know what direction that we need to go, if you need that kind of direction in your own life, and we all do, we all need it more often than we care to admit, you are not doubting God's love or God's will. You're simply asking for a direction on a decision that you've already made, you'll go in that direction once he points you in that direction. You'll go. I'm not going to quibble with him. I'm not going to argue with him. You know, I've laughed before. There's a lot of folks, when you ask them to do something in the church, they will tell you, well, Brother Scott, I need to go pray about that. And you've heard my take on that. Listen, you need to pray. You need to ask God's will, and you need to seek God's face, and you need to know what to do. But don't you dare go ask Him, Oh, Lord, release me from that commitment. <laughs> oh, Lord, I don't want to have to do that. Can I do something else? Well, if that's what you got to pray, pray it. But you better be ready for Him to give you a job and a ministry and something to do that you will prove out who He is to the rest of the world. Ahaz disobeyed a direct command from the Lord. So here's some direct commands. Just I'm going to just shotgun it to you here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's a direct command. Will you do that one? Will you be holy as your Father in heaven is holy? Can we not let sin reign in our mortal body? Romans chapter 6. Can we put to death... Romans chapter 8, that we need to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit that we may live. Are you pursuing peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord? It does say that. Pursue peace with all men. That's a daunting task in the 21st century, even in independence. That's a daunting task, to pursue peace with all men. We're not at war with anybody. We don't want to go to war with anybody. Will you pursue peace with all men? And will you pursue the sanctification? Hebrews 12, 14, 15. Pursue the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. What's your sanctification based in? Is it based in all your good deeds and all your good works and you're going to hand them up to God one day? Or is your sanctification based on the blood of Jesus Christ and by faith you've received that and now you work as a result of your salvation, not in order to secure it. If justification's by faith, sanctification's got to be by faith and glorification's got to be by faith and that faith also has elbow grease and shoe leather applied to it. This is not a passive thing that we do as followers of Jesus Christ. So the first question to check your direction is, are you, will you live in the world of practical ideas and solutions or will you live as a child of God in the kingdom of God where we are beggars and pleading and knowing that he will answer? We're just one beggar telling another beggar where we got our bread. Will you be obedient to the clear commands of the Lord? Will you be his witnesses both in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the... World, will you? I mean, that looks like a direct command to me. 
And how about the Great Commission? Go and make disciples. Are we doing that? You know, you and I weren't called to plant churches. There's no scripture that I could find where it says we go plant churches. What we're supposed to do is make disciples. And if we make disciples, churches will spring up. Because that's what believers do. They gather together to worship and to sing and to study and to, to know God's word. Lastly, last question. Will you feign your own piety in your own disobedience and distrust while living in the world of practical solutions and supposed worldly solutions? What does he do? Verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Well, what's he doing? Well, he's quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Which, what's that in reference to? That's in reference to Exodus 17, where they didn't have any water. They lacked water. And what was the big issue? Was it the lack of water? Was it their need for water? No, that was not the issue. What was the issue of the Hebrew people in the wilderness? The issue was they were griping and complaining about what God was doing. That's the issue. Instead of just going to the Lord and saying, Lord, we're thirsty. Lord, we need a drink. Lord, we're not going to survive unless you bring us some water. We're not going to make it, Lord. Bring us some water. Moses led us out into this desert to die. <laughs> That's as dramatic as I get. Unless I'm watching the Chiefs game. He feigns his own piety. I will not test the Lord. You know, Jesus even quotes this, right, in the second temptation in the wilderness when Satan is tempting Jesus to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple when Satan quotes Psalm 91, 11, and 12. Now, if you go read that, it's exactly pretty much what the devil quotes. It's just out of context. And I wish he'd have read verse 13. I think it's 13 or 14 in Psalm 91 because it says that you will tread on the head of the serpent. Well, see, the old devil, he don't quote that piece. He just quotes his other piece out of context. And what does Jesus say? We're not going to tempt the Lord. We're not tempting God. The Lord cares for us all the time. You don't have to test him to see if he will perform some miracle or sign to prove himself again to you. Do you? Do you need him to do something else? In order that you would be obedient, what else you want him to do? I say that all the time. I'm never going to get over saying that as long as I'm standing in a pulpit. What else do you want God to do? He sent his own son, his only begotten son, to, die, to live a sinless life in a wicked world. It's wicked. He died that your sins might be forgiven if you would but believe in him. Well, we got people out there all around. Why? When Jesus looks at him in Luke 6 and says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you don't do anything I say. You don't do anything I say. You got to obey his commandments and you can't feign, fake your own piety. Oh, I will not trust the Lord, my God. He just told you, you could ask for that. You're not tempting him or testing him when he said that you could do it. There's no test there. You just have to do what he said to do. You can't play games with it. Once again, and you've seen it, I've seen it over the course of our lives where people will twist those scriptures around. We're not testing God. We're not tempting God in any way by asking him for a sign of which direction we should go when we're ready to go in the direction, whatever direction he points us in. However he wants to do it, we're ready to go. You know, we can quibble with Gideon a little bit, you know, fleece wet, ground dry, fleece dry, ground wet. We might quibble with Gideon a little bit. It's like, dude, you ask for two signs. You asked for one sign and he did it. You asked for another sign and he did it. Well, we learned from that. God gave him the second sign. 
Why? Because Gideon wanted to do what God had called him to do. Gideon wasn't in rebellion against God. Gideon wasn't in any form or fashion trying to get out of a gig. He wasn't trying to get out of the task that was set before him. He just wanted to make sure, Lord, is really me? Me? Really? I mean, a guy who was a coward, he was hanging out in, what was he hanging out in the wine press, threshing out grain. So he's hiding. Ahaz feigned piety in real disobedience and it had terrible consequences for the generations to come. Motyer writes in his commentary, from this point on the Davidic line is merely a puppet of Assyria and then of Babylon to come when Babylon comes to wipe Judah into exile. And then he wrote that when Jesus, Matthew picks up on this, do we, do we know 100% exactly what Isaiah, did he, you know, because I know what Ahaz thought. Ahaz thought there's going to be a bunch of young mothers running around with a bunch of kids named Emmanuel. That's what he thought. And he thought wrong. I have no idea what Isaiah thought, but here's what I know. Isaiah used the words in such a way that they exactly fit what Matthew picks up on when Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary without relations to Joseph in any way, in any form, in any fashion until after Jesus was born. The Bible is very clear about that. There's no, there really can be no discussion about that. It just says what it means. Ahaz could have been saved by faith, couldn't he? He could have been saved by faith. That's the only way actually to be saved, is to be saved by faith. What did he do? He chose his own works. I'll save myself, I'll save myself, I'll save myself. And this is kind of the beginning of the end. As we look back, I, I, I looked it up last night, roughly 150 years prior to Ahaz, go back to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat, one of my all-time favorite stories in the Old Testament. They are surrounded by three armies and Jehoshaphat and his people are fearful and they have no idea what to do and they turn to the Lord and they, he gets on his face and he prays to the Lord and the Lord sends Ahaziel, the prophet, to him and says, hey, this ain't your fight. This ain't your fight. This is God's fight. I'm going to tell you what to do. You go out there on the valley, you're going to see him come up from the valley. I think it's Ziz, Z-I-Z. You're going to see him come up that way. You go out there to meet him. But don't you fight this battle. It's God's battle to fight. Don't you worry about it. He's going to fight it for you. What does Jehoshaphat do? Well, they have a little worship service that they got an answer from the Lord. And what do they do the next morning? Well, they load up and they follow the clear commands of God and they go right out in overlooking the valley and they see them coming up. Now, Ahaziel, the prophet, never tells them. He says, just go out there, go out there. And then he kind of uses the words of Moses. Stand and see your deliverance. Just like when Moses stood and they parted the Red Sea. Stand and see your deliverance. So Jehoshaphat goes out there and they see the armies coming up. And they're standing there to see their deliverance. But there's a verse in 20, chapter 20 that says, When they began praising and singing to the Lord, God set the ambush. They were not commanded by Ahaziel to go and to sing. They were not commanded by him to have a worship service. But that's what people of God do. They went out there and they worshipped the answer before the answer showed up. Now that's faith. Listen, I believe so strongly in the inerrancy of Scripture and in the way the words are written that even in our English Bible, when it says, and when they began singing and praising, God set the ambush. And what they do? They killed each other. <laughs> God does crazy stuff like that. He just turned them on each other. And then what happens? They go pick up all the spoils. They get all the booty, the loot. They get it all. 
That's what happens when you just simply do what God has called us to do. When you simply obey the clear commands of God. When you beg God in the midst of a pickle that our life gets in from time to time, when you beg Him for answers and for a direction and way to go. And What does James say? If you lack wisdom, just ask. And that wisdom is the wisdom of God in how to interact in the world. That's what he's talking about in James. If you don't have it, ask Him. He will tell you what it is you need to do. So maybe you're here today and you haven't come to that point where you have explicitly, uh, externally vocalized your faith in Jesus Christ, that you have received Him and you believe that He died on the cross for the payment of your sins. And that this virgin birth prophecy Looks like it's right now in front of Ahaz, but it's kind of like standing on the mountain peaks, right? And there's another mountain peak out there, but you can't really see how long the valley is. You just see that mountain peak out there. That's where this is going to happen. And Isaiah gives us a clue that this is not right now in chapter 9. Maybe we'll look at that one of these weeks. Because he says, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's not here yet. And then he gives us that great that great text in, what, 9-7, Eternal Father, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. The government will be on His shoulders and there will be no end to it and it will only increase. That's the future and Isaiah pushes it off just to the future. It's coming. Well, it has come. And as we head to Christmas, you're going to hear me say this until you're sick of hearing me say it because I'm a one-trick pony. Don't be so enamored with simply the baby in the manger. Because the baby in the manger doesn't secure anything for you. The baby in the manger has to live 33 or so years on planet earth to be the man on the cross. The baby in the manger, the man on the cross can't happen without the baby in the manger. But the baby in the manger is not the end of the story. That's the beginning of the story. The end of it is the cross and then resurrection. Because without resurrection, you don't know if it was all true. It could all just be a good story and it was all just puff magic. It all went up in air. But because Jesus was raised from the dead, this stuff is all hanging together. It's all true. You better get in line with it. Have you received Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? Are you following Him? Are you quibbling with Him about your call to ministry? I mean, I haven't done this in forever. Maybe there's somebody in here that the Lord's calling out to come to ministry and to do vocational ministry and to be a minister. And man, you need to, you need to quit dilly-dallying along and get about it. We need to work while the, it's day because night's coming when nobody's going to work. As a church, man, the clear commands of God. Let's just follow them. No feigned piety. We're just trying to be real, authentic Christians. No, no feigned piety. We're not faking it. We're just one struggler helping another struggler get to the end of the road. That's who we are. Did you plant your ministry here? Man, there's work. There's work. And it is not for the faint of heart. But it is for the heart that is sealed in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we are enamored with you. And Father, we see Ahaz as such a negative example that we don't ever want to be him. Father, we want our joy and our piety before you to just be real and authentic and gracious and humble. Father, help us to just see the clear commands of the Scripture and just obey them. And Father, the world has solutions and and you use the world's solutions to aid your own children. And we know that, Father, but we trust in you, not in the world's solutions. You twist the world the way you need it to twist to advance your kingdom and use us to that level. And and we are secure in you by faith that we will not surrender our faith for one second in the face of the enemy who likes to camp uh, around us. Father, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the stronghold and defense of our life. Who will we dread? And the answer is no one. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What is our hymn of invitation, Bill? 407, because he lives. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow.
And the reason we sing because he lives is because he died. He died and then he lives again that you and I can face tomorrow. So if you're looking for a church home, we would invite you to plant your ministry right here at Sycamore Hills. Uh, there's work to do. There's more than enough work to share the load. So come and take part in that. If, if you're looking, if you've not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is the safest and grandest place. Let me say this real quickly. The devil will tell adults that you missed it, you missed it, you missed it. It's too late, you missed it. Everybody will be embarrassed for an adult to come forward. Everybody will be embarrassed. That is a lie right out of the pit of hell. There isn't a single person that would be embarrassed for anybody to get saved. In fact, we might have a party. This is the grandest place to be saved. <laughs> so if you haven't done that, I'd invite you to come and, and plant your faith in Jesus Christ as we sing. Let's stand and sing, because he lives. We'll sing the first, first and last verses. First and last verse, 407. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, hail and forgive. He lived and died to buy This, men, uh, this morning, like we said, next servant up, and they graciously did that, so we appreciate them so much. Pray for Tony, as hopefully they'll be on the road shortly to be home. Uh, we will have business meeting, short service tonight, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to look at that a little bit, line of encouragement, and uh, so come and take part of that. Let me close with this. Now, uh, the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>